<laughs> Make the Torah's word sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name in the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. <clears throat> are you ready? We who live in the shelter of Elyon spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God, in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague that roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open, and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. <clears throat> no disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent, for he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. They will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone. We will tread down lions and snakes, young lions and serpents. We will trample underfoot. Because he loves me, I will rescue him. Because he knows my name, I will protect him. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my salvation. Do I have a shout? Let it be true in your own life. Amen. Stand before the Lord as we read from Numbers chapter 30 and then also Psalms chapter 143 and then from the Brit Kadashah, Mark chapter 5, 25 through 28. <clears throat> Moses told the people of Israel everything just as Adonai had ordered Moses. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the people of Israel and he said, here is what Adonai has ordered. When a man makes a vow to Adonai or formally obligates himself by swearing an oath, he is not to break his word, but is to do everything he said he would do. When a woman makes a vow to Adonai, formally obligating herself, while she is a minor living in her father's house, I'm sure it continues to say that she is not to break her word. Hallelujah. <laughs> Shibua le sor i sar el nafsho lo achel da bor ke kal hayotse mi poa ya se vi sha ki te dor ne del ya yahova vasara i sar e bet i baya bin ureya mi shama i be et ne dra vesara asher asra el nafsha ve kherish la abiya vi ga we kamu kal na dereya, we kal isar asher asra al nafsha yakum. Psalms 143.5. I remember the days of old, reflecting on all your deeds, thinking about the work of your hands. Zakarti yamim mikedem hagiti bikal paalak bema asa v'yedak asocheach. Mark chapter 5, 25 through 28. Among them was a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had suffered a great deal of under many physicians, she had spent her life savings, yet instead of improving, she still had grown worse. She had heard about Yeshua, so she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his robe, or his tzitzits. For she said, if I touch even his clothes, I will be healed. Visha haita bezob dameya shteim esra shana vihian aha harbeta het ider rofim rabim. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, that everlasting life from the midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. You may be seated, but hold on to your seats. Zeke took a drink of water because he came to me and said, please have a three-hour sermon, and I said, I can do it. I believe 
<clears throat> that I can do it. So he took a big swig of water just to get it going. Hallelujah. Make sure you open up your Bibles and make sure you get your notes. Get ready to take it because we need to be a people of desperation. You know, the, the book of Numbers and the Torah portion talks about making a vow. When you make a vow to Adonai, you should keep it. Do everything you can to, that, that, to make sure that it's fulfilled because you are obligated to Adonai to fulfill those things that you have said you want to do. And all of us in somewhere in our lives have asked God for revival, for change, for God to do some, some supernatural things in our lives. True? And we have committed ourselves to follow through. Make sure that your vow is yay. When I was looking at this, I kind of <clears throat> did this different ways. I, I did my study, and then I did my PowerPoint, and then I prayed some more, and then I went back and redid my PowerPoint. So hopefully my PowerPoint's okay. Um, because I wanted to look at two things, two things, <clears throat> one in the New Testament, one in the Old Testament. Before I get going on this desperation, I found two people that was full of desperation. And because they were full of desperation, they were willing to do whatever it took to get what they needed from Yehovah. The first one we read today in Mark chapter 5, we know it well, is the woman with the issue of blood. And we know that, that when we look at that scripture, that scripture says that she had done everything that she could. She has <clears throat> uh, actually just um, stretched herself and spent her money and so on and so forth. And that her desperation, and we'll talk about it at the end, brought her to a place of getting out of that sick bed and finding her healer. She wanted it that bad. The second one that I want to look at and spend a little bit more time on is we find in 1 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it's the story of Hannah. And we all know the story of Hannah, correct? Hannah is a very powerful story. Hannah is one of two wives to Elkanah. And his uh, first wife, and of course Hannah is the second wife, the, Hannah is barren. The first one um, uh, is a, a wife that is a rival wife in that she's had sons and she's had daughters. And when I look at 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 6, it says um, her, her uh, rival taunted her and made her feel bad because Adonai had kept her from having children. So this is not an occasion. You know, we look at Hannah sometimes and we say, okay, Hannah just wanted a baby, so she was upset about not having a baby, so she went to the altar. We make the story very short. <clears throat> but in Hannah's life, the story is not short because she's been married to her husband for a very long time, uh, long enough that the other wife has had many children. She has, and they have, been going to the tabernacle many times. And therefore, for many years, this rival wife would mock her. Many years, she would make fun of Hannah, provoking her in order to irritate her. Year after year, day after day, Hannah was teased. She was taunted. She was mocked. She was ridiculed. Every year, they would go to the tabernacle in Shalom, the place and center of worship in those days. And when we look at verses 3 through 8, it says, This man went up from his city every year to worship and sacrifice to Adonai, Seva, Old, and Shalom. He went up every year. And the two sons of Eli <clears throat> were Koedim of Adonai there. And one day when Elkanah was sacrificing, he gave a portion of the sacrifice to his wife, Penana, and um, portions to each of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved Hannah, even though Adonai had kept her from having children. Her rival taunted her, made her feel bad because Adonai had kept her from having children. He did the same every year. And, she, and every time she went up to the house of Adonai, she taunted her so much that she would cry and not eat. Her husband said to her, Hannah, why are you crying? And Why aren't you eating? Why be so sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Year after year after year, <clears throat> barren. Year after year, taunted. Year after year, teased, mocked, and ridiculed. And I was thinking that so many of us have asked God to do something. But 
Well, your child's not back yet. Your husband's not saved yet. Your wife's not doing this right. Oh, this has not happened in your life. Oh, your needs have not yet been met. You've been praying for this, and you don't have it. And year after year, every time we come to the house of the Lord, and we stretch forth our hands in faith, every time we say, yes, Lord, I believe it, I believe it, and we speak in faith, whether it's a healing or deliverance or we're praying for someone or praying for ourselves, we hear the voice of the enemy mock and uh, 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 come against us and ridicule us because we have not yet received received what we know we want and what we believe that God can give us. Her husband loved Hannah, gave her extra portion for the sacrifice, but that didn't heal her pain. All the praise and all the worship, all the reading of the word, sometimes doesn't heal the pain because you need something, right? Right? And you need something desperately. And you need something that you yourself cannot change. Because the one who calls her to be barren is the only one that can open her womb. Right? So therefore, it has to be a miracle of God. It cannot be something she does. It cannot be something someone else does. You either are going to conceive or not conceive. That's by the hand of Jehovah. Sometimes we are praying for things that you yourself can't change. You can't do it. You have no power in it. You have no authority in it. You don't have the the power necessary or the money to change anything. It's where you are. It's what's going on. And year after year and day after day, the enemy teases you, taunts you, mocks you, and ridicules you because you don't have what you know God has for you. Then one year, someone say one year, something snapped inside of Hannah. Now remember, <clears throat> I set the stage because she would go to the tabernacle every year, and every year she'd be taunted, and every year when she was taunted, she would cry, and every year he'd give her a double portion and say, I'm sorry, it's okay, you know I love you. But this year, something snapped in her. And what I mean by snapped <clears throat> is that now she suddenly refused to endure the taunts. Something happened within her that she refused at this moment to accept her childless status. Every other year, she would listen to her rival uh, 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 woman uh, and wife of the, of, the father, of the husband, and she would just go and take it, and bring it to herself, and go back home. But this year, something happened, and she went to an altar where she was going to cry out to God and refuse to believe that her status of barren was hers. Verse 9. So Hannah got up after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Eli the Cohen was sitting on his seat by the doorpost of the temple of Adonai. This is a moment that would have great ramifications, not only in the life of Hannah, not only in the life of her husband, but in the life of Israel. I believe that we're living in a day and age where even when we come to this August of month of Elul and we have the Yom Kippur and all this prayer, I believe that we're coming to a place uh, and a moment that will have great ramifications. A moment where we have finally snapped in saying something has to be different. Something has to be done. I don't believe that I can live in the state that I am in or the lack that I have or the lack of presence and power in my life anymore. That's not what God wants. The Word of God says that in verse 10, in deep, and a complete Jewish Bible says depression, but in other translations, in deep desperation, she prayed to Adonai and cried. There's a reason why that is mentioned, because when you go to the tabernacle, when you go to worship, there are certain prayers that you say, right? If you've been around Jewish people, if you've ever been to a synagogue, it is uh, a traditional prayer after traditional prayer after traditional prayer. When we go into our own egg, we'll say the traditional prayer over the lights, we'll say it over our juice, we'll say it over our bread. And so when they went to the synagogue, when they went to the temple, the tabernacle, what she would do is she was praying those prayers. What a woman would pray, the woman has her own little prayer book. They would pray, she would pray those prayers. And every single time when she prayed those prayers, that was wonderful, that was a blessing. God looked 
looked at it, but it never changed her status of being barren. Until she snaps. And when she snaps and she goes beside the priest to go pray, she doesn't bring her prayer book any longer. Because her answer is not in her prayer book. The answer is not in her theology, theology of how she needs to say this and when she needs to say it and when she needs to bow and when she needs to get up and when she needs to cover herself and when she needs to uncover herself. It's coming from the heart now. She's desperate. She's desperate. She's tired of hearing the mocking. She's tired of hearing the ridicule. She knows if God can give that wife of sons and daughters, he can also open her womb. He can do it for her. He can do it for her. So she went to the altar this time differently <clears throat> in deep desperation. Do you understand, church, until we get to a place of deep desperation? She didn't pray or recite mental prayers. <clears throat> we all know how to do that. We know verses that align with what we need. You need a healing? We speak healing verses. You need deliverance? You speak delivering verses. You need God to supply your need? You speak supply your need verses. And all of that is good because you're supposed to meditate on the Word day and night. You're supposed to pray the Word of God. But there's something missing, and what is missing is the desperation. Do you really want what you're asking God for? <clears throat> do you really want it? Because if you really want it, then guess what? Prayer would be on Tuesday. Prayer would be on Thursday. Prayer would be before the service. Prayer would be, and it's a different prayer. It's not a prayer that's been written down, a prayer that you know by heart, a prayer that is very easy for you to come out. It's a prayer that comes from the heart with groanings and desperate and depression and, and, and crying unto God. A simple woman amid corrupt religious establishment, desperate, she will usher in a new day in Israel's history because she's going to give birth to a powerful man. She would dedicate her son to Jehovah for as long as he lived. Remember, if you give me this baby, <clears throat> I will give this baby back to you. That's desperate. See, most of us want something that changes us, then it's ours and we keep it. But what if your desperate cry was, make me a vessel that I can, I can change someone. Make me, make me a vessel, a container that I can have your living water, that it can go out to someone. Make me a fire that it doesn't just burn me and consume me, but it goes out and burns people. Let me be something that changes something or someone. If you read 17 through 19, then Eli replied, go in peace because she's praying a little crazy. Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant what you have asked of him. She replied, may your servant find favor in your sight. So the woman went on her way, and she what? Oh, don't, don't overlook that. Because every time she would come to the tabernacle, she would lose her appetite <clears throat> because she was taunted by this rival wife. Every time she'd come, she would be crying. She would be whipping. She couldn't eat. And, the, and her husband said, why aren't you eating? Why can't you eat? But guess what? She came this time with a desperate cry. She got before the altar with a desperate cry. And the man of God looked at her and said, may God grant you favor. And that moment, that moment in her desperation, she realized God has answered her prayer. And she got up and she ate. And her face was no longer sad. You know what happens when you pray in desperation? Things happen. Now, here's the thing. It didn't happen that she immediately got pregnant right there at the altar. It means that she knew by faith that what God had said and what she had asked was going to come to pass, which changes her countenance. Which changes the way that she gets up and walks. See, from year after year, even when she would lay with her husband, she knew that her womb was barren. But this time, when she was going to lay with her husband, she knew that she had prayed and God heard her prayer. And the man of God had granted her favor. And this time would be different. This time, people, this year, it will be different. This, <clears throat> this fall feast will 
be different. It will not only change the world, but it will change a church. It will not only change a church, but it will change you. It will not only change you, it will change all those around you. If we pray in desperate prayer, don't come on those uh, Tuesday nights and, and Thursday nights with your, with your list of what you want to pray. Fall on your face. Weep before God. Ask God, God, help us. Change us. She knew her faith reached heaven, and heaven, hallelujah, would reach down to earth. That's when it gets exciting, when you know you've touched something. And in verse 19, it says, They got up early in the morning, and they worshiped before Adonai, then returned and came to their house in Ramah. And then Elkanah laid with her, and Adonai remembered her. What did it? How don't I remember? Desperation. Why would the woman with the issue of blood touching the hem of his garment have the wholeness and the virtue leave his garment? Because desperation touched him. Why was the blind able to see? Because desperation cried out to him. Desperation. How desperate are we? Hannah could have chosen to live in denial like some of us do all the time. Hannah could have forgotten her heartache. She could have just said, I'm barren, I will always be barren, and that's what it is. My husband's like this, he will always be this way. My wife's like this, she will always be this way. My children are like this, they will always be this way. My finances are like this, they will always be this way. My life is like this, it will always be this way. And so you live in this denial that this is the station that God has for you. This is the place where God has for you. You can't go any higher, you can't, certainly can go lower, but you, you're just going to stay where you're at. And somehow, no matter whether you want this or want that, and you don't got it, you will live in the heartache. And she could have denied her barrenness. But neither did she accept it. You can recognize where you are and what you need. The thing is, have you accepted it? She could have faced the truth. You know, you always have people in your life that want to tell you, you need to face the truth. Here's the truth. You want a baby, you want a boy, but you're fruitless. Face the truth. She could have said, listen, okay, I'm done. I've <clears throat> year after year after year after year, then who cares? And she could have camouflaged her want by saying, I don't want a child. I'll live the way I'm living because God's going to help me. I'm living with my burden that I've got to carry my burden. She could have just been in denial and lived a life of saying, this is my station. She could have forgotten her heartache. She could have just rejoiced in the fact that she was a child of Abraham, part of the covenant. Hallelujah. This is what I am. At least I'm saved. Saved I am. Glory to God. She could have said, no child, then it must be God's sovereign will. The way my situation is, it must be God's sovereign will. The way my marriage is, it must be God's sovereign will. The way my children are, it must be God's sovereign will. Where my job is, it must be God's sovereign will. The way the church is, it must be just God's sovereign will. But the thing about Hannah is that Hannah did not deny her barrenness. And neither did she accept it forever. Her unique prayer became the channel that Yehovah would both prompt and then use to turn the tide in Israel and bring much blessing. How do you know you're not the one? How do you know not for such a time as this? How do you know you're not a Samuel? How do you know you're not an Esther? How do you know you're not a Peter? How do you know you're not a Mary? We must not silently accept our lack of fruitfulness and somehow justify it as Jehovah's will for us. Well, we live in a small town, so small town is what we got, and this is what we have. No. We must not silently accept our lack of fruitfulness. 
you have to admit first that you're barren. We have to first admit that we are not exhibiting Acts chapter 2 in our life or corporately. And then we have to not accept it that that's what God wants. Then we have to become so desperate, so tired of the ridicule and the mocking. Aren't you tired of the ridicule and mocking of the world that tells you where's your God? Hannah faced her circumstances, then desperately prayed for Yahweh to change them. Face them, pray for change. You know, <clears throat> Yaakov chapter 5, verse 16, a very simple verse that says, Therefore, openly acknowledge your sins to one another. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You have to at least acknowledge your situation. <laughs> Desperate, soul-stirring prayers like hers will create answers. How many need a breakthrough? Mark 5, 25 through 34, the woman with the issue of blood, 12 years of hemorrhaging, suffered on the physicians, spent all her life savings, no improvement, grown worse. And what does she say? She could have laid in that bed like most of us would lay in that bed and said, I'm tired. I'm done. It's over. I can't move anymore. Uh, this is, must be what God wants. Even though I'm a child of Abraham, I'm just going to lay, uh, lay here, and I'm going to wait for death to come because I don't have the energy. I don't have the power. I don't have the faith. But what did she want? There was a desperateness within her. Now, it took how many years? Twelve. Hannah, it took sons and daughters to come. But one day, people, this is our one day. And she laid there and said, I have no physician to help me. I have no money to help me. I have no family to help me. Because remember, in those days, if you have an issue of blood, that means you're unclean. If you're unclean, no family comes near you. It means if you had a husband, he has to leave. If you had children, they have to leave. Until you stop bleeding and then get okayed from the priest, you are unclean. Everyone's out. But in her desperateness, what's going to make her desperate? Twelve years. Still bleeding. No money. No one can help her. See, as long as we think we have hope in us, we don't become desperate. As long as you think you can change things, you'll not have a desperate prayer. You'll come and do your worship. You'll come and do your praising. <clears throat> you'll come and speak your word. You'll come and pray. You'll read your Bible. You'll listen to me preach. But until you're desperate, there will be no improvement. Until there's, you're desperate, there will be no change because God is listening for the cry of a people. And here's her cry. If I touch even his clothes, say it with me, I will be healed. Desperation. Someone shout it. You know, an evangelist, Ravenhill, said, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. Revival is the only hope for our nation. Our survival as a society is dependent upon a revived, transformed kehila. As the church goes, so... The world goes. So what we need to do is that we need to seize the moment that we have been given. And I believe we've been given a moment. As these last days are upon us, deep darkness, moral compromise, the church is crazy, the world is crazy, the body of Yeshua, we cannot afford to remain a sleeping giant. You have to wake yourself up. But you won't until you're desperate. And the thing about that is, maybe Hannah could have had a baby sooner. Maybe the woman with the issue of blood could have been healed quicker. But sometimes we settle into where we're at. As a society and church are embracing sin as acceptable, and that's what we're doing, the church is abandoning the power of Pentecost. Some of you have not been filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to be. 
Some of you have been filled with the Holy Ghost, need to be refilled. Some of you need a shot of something. Spiritually, not a shot of anything else. The very dynamic that sets us apart to begin with is what many have considered unpopular, controversial, and part of a division. Can't be that radical, can't be that this, can't be doing that, can't be leaving that. So, you know what? It's time for LOJ to go after revival with full force. Desperate. Not asking you whole for something new and different. We're not asking for that. But what we're doing is we're, we're longing for the restoration of the old and the ancient and the powerful. The new stuff is not working. The old stuff raised people from the dead. The old stuff called blind eyes to see. The old stuff called withered hands to grow. The old stuff caused a, a prostitute to turn her life around and follow the Messiah. That's the type of power we need in our lives. And that's the type of power we're missing. What qualifies us, me, you, line of Judah, to steward a powerful move of the rule of Kakadesh? See, sometimes we look for other other ministries to do it, other people. Maybe, maybe they have a stage. Maybe they have something greater. Maybe they have a, a voice. Maybe they have <clears throat> something that they can, seems to be reaching many people. It only takes one. The qualification that we have is it is simply giving your life and destiny to being a custodian of Jehovah's presence has nothing to do with your ability, has nothing to do with your education, has nothing to do with your articulation, has nothing to do with your eloquence, has nothing to do with being a good preacher, or I'd be out. So would you. There's more people that have greater ability, more people that have greater education, can articulate even nicely, beautifully, eloquent. When they walk into a room, you're amazed. It's simply giving your life, your destiny, your ministry to being a custodian. God, give me your presence and let me hold it, orchestrate it, be a good steward of it, give it out. That's it. You know, more than pleasing people, we have to endeavor to accommodate Jehovah's presence. We're so busy. Accommodating people. We see that in this day and age with people. You, so you, someone doesn't agree with someone, so we all boycott that. Someone doesn't agree with that. We all boycott that. Someone stands up and has to have this about this. We just can't, we can't even have our own opinions anymore. Remember when you used to have one? And remember when you could voice it without getting hit over the head? The thing is, lasting transformation only takes place because of an encounter with the Ruach HaKadosh. Yehovah is the only one capable of breaking into our heart, setting it ablaze with holy zeal. I can't change you. You can't even change yourself. He alone. He alone demolishes strongholds. He cancels curses. He overcomes impossibilities. He breaks addictions. He heals sick bodies. He delivers tormented souls. Right? See, revival will come when we desperately cry out for his presence. In the age of PPE, I gave it PPP. You need PPP. Beyond this personal protective equipment, PPE, you need PPP. You need to push you need to pave, and you need to position yourself. What does PPP mean? Prayer can push you out of your comfort zone. Pave the way for extraordinary move of Ruach. And then position you to be in sync with your holiest purposes for revival. Where's your PPP? You think all you need is your PPE. It's like that man that was in an accident in Florida. Killed as he was cra as it crashed. He died of COVID. 
even though he's in a crash. My point is this. You can do all the PPE, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, but I'm saying the PPE, you can do all you can, but you know God's in control of everything, isn't he? So you need the PPP. You need to know how to push, pave, and position. And no matter how broken or unusual or confusing your personal history is, (laughs) and I know some of you, and it is quite broken, quite unusual, and certainly to everyone else, quite confusing. But Yehovah uses every element to bring you into divine destiny, which means whatever you've been through, whatever you've done, whatever path you went down, whatever <clears throat> wrong you did, whatever mistake you made, he's still going to use it all. That's how good he is. You give me something broken, I can't do nothing with it. You tell me to put something together and it's very confusing, I'm going to look at you like you're crazy. I'm going to go pay someone $10 to put together. Not like Josh. He likes to put things together. I'm going to say, Josh, you like things? Yes, and here's $10 to put this together for me. You're satisfied. You got $10 put together. I'm satisfied. It's together for me before I get it. But revival is not birth through preaching. I can preach every good sermon. I can preach about revival. I can preach about fire. I can preach and preach and preach. I can say I'm going to preach for the, for the next 10 days, and all of you come, and I can preach for hours upon hours, and Zeke would be so excited and say amen. But the revival is through prayer, not through preaching. We need to understand something. We need to understand the priority of prayer and experience the authentic presence of the Spirit of God. We need to let Yehovah. Shape us for greater things that are about to come. I'm not ready to be put on a shelf yet. But here's the thing. PPP. I have to train myself to be a prayer warrior. See, oh, glory to God. I know some people are prayer warriors. I believe you're a prayer warrior, so I'm going to give you my prayer to pray. No. We're all prayer warriors. Pastor, I get to prayer, and then I I wander off, and I start to pray, and I think about the things I got to get at Walmart, and then I start to pray, and I think about the things I'm going to wear tomorrow, and then I get to prayer, and I start just thinking about the ocean. Because you haven't trained yourself. Right? Have you ever done a task that you didn't want to do and found it that you had to continue to push yourself to do it? Right? Right? When you're in a car driving, I tell my students all the time, where you look is where you go. So pay attention. You have to train yourself. Not Look at that car. I say look down quickly and then look back up. Don't look at your speedometer all the time because when you look at your speedometer, you go wherever you. You have to train yourself. Turn to someone and say train yourself. You know, Tuesday will be a training. Thursday will be a training. Then Tuesday again will be a training. Thursday will be a training. Tuesday will be a training. And Thursday will be a training. And every Saturday is a training, which means you might have to get up a little earlier to be here at 10 o'clock. You might have to come and, and, and forget about some fellowship because you have to fellowship afterwards. It might mean that you have to come and lay before the altar and pray and seek God, and you, don't, and you run out of things to say. Then you just have to hum or something. Train yourself. That's two hours, Pastor. (laughs) Oh, but a good movie you can watch for three. A good meal you can sit there and wait for it for an hour and a half. Going to ride something at King's Dominion, you'll stand in line for three hours. For three seconds. We each have an individual relationship with Yeshua. We have received him as our Savior and Lord, but we need mentorship, we need discipleship, and we need to get trained. P, P, P. We have to change what is happening because we have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know what's coming down the pike. That's from my old days, coming down the pike. But I want to be ready, and I want to be used. 
You know, the Scripture offers us, we, we read Psalm, uh, Psalms 143, but let me read a couple of them. Uh, Psalm 77 says, So I remind myself of Jehovah's doings. Yes, I remind, remember your work, wonders of old. Psalms 105, 5 says, Remember the wonders he has done, his signs and his spoken rulings. Uh, Psalms 143, 5 says, I remember the days of old, reflecting on all your deeds, thinking about the work of your hands. But that means this, you have to start remembering what God has done than what he can do. And if you have nothing in your life that he's done, then go read Acts. This, look what he's done in Acts. You know, when we drift away from the dynamic demonstration of our faith, and how many's ever drifted away? You don't even know you're drifting until you hear the tires on the stones. When we drift away from this dynamic demonstration of our faith, we are in desperate need of revival. We need to create an atmosphere for the presence of Yehovah. And that atmosphere is called prayer. When Yeshua is about ready to die, when he's about ready to carry the weight of the world on his shoulders, when he's about ready to yield his whole entire life to the Father and give himself up in a very horrific way, you don't find him in a building praising. You don't find him worshiping. You don't find him reading. And there's nothing wrong with any of those. Where do you find him? Praying. When Hannah needs her womb to be open, where do you find her? When a woman with the issue of blood needs to be healed, where do you find her? She's praying, if I would touch the hem. Prayer creates an atmosphere. And what's the first thing the enemy takes away from us? And what I mean by takes away from us, lets us drift away where that's the last thing. That's the first thing that falls off. We can't even say a long prayer for our meals because it takes too long. Listen, church. We were never established to be an organization alone. It is a community of called out ones, filled with the Ruach and empowered to do the works of Yeshua on the earth, a gathering of on fire people, burning bright. The supernatural needs to become natural to us. And I hate to say that if we had someone healed, we would just explode because that was the first time we ever saw, saw it. It should be natural. Someone say, hey, man, the other day in church there were some healings. Again? Who this time? Instead of tell me about it, what's going on? Wow. It became so natural for Yeshua that people followed him just to see it happen. What we have to do is stop living beneath our spiritual inheritance. Do you know what you have received? Do you know what you have been given? Do you know what he died for to give to you? He gave the spiritual inheritance that greater things you will do than he has done. And we have to get back to that power of the Spirit of God. We have to let Yehovah breathe on us afresh. We have to let him multiply our corporate level of hunger, thirst, and also desire for revival. How many remember what Yehovah has done in your life? Do you remember some of the stories that you could tell of his mighty power? Because those testimonies create hunger in the people that are listening. You know, when the apostles went out, and I'm getting ready to close, when the apostles went out, they didn't say, let me take you through the Romans road. You know how they got people to come to Yeshua? They testified to what Yeshua did, who he was, and how he changed their life. You're trying to memorize all these scriptures to go out and be a witness. The witness is, what has God done in your life? How has he changed things in your life? Who are you now because of his life? And there shouldn't be a dry well. We need to cry out 
in desperation. Our discontentment needs to drive us. We've been barren long enough. We've been mocked and ridiculed long enough. Find yourself to the altar and cry. We're not called to be sleepwalking through our Christian life. Sleepwalkers don't know what they just did. They go right back to sleep. This is not Jehovah's desire for us. Yeshua didn't die so that we could kind of wander aimlessly, powerlessly through life, only to experience a reprieve when we die and get to heaven. If your only excitement is that when you die, you get to heaven. That's a sad tale of your life. This life is so horrible. I just well, can't wait till I die and go to heaven. There's streets of gold. It's going to be beautiful. Water's going to be crystal. Is that all you got to live for? Then you might as well just roll up right now. You were born into something profoundly supernatural. You were born for such a time as this. The apostles were born at such a time as they were born. Esther was born. Son, she was born. Other people were born. Church fathers were born. We were born for this time. And whatever comes down the road and whatever is going that we're going to experience, don't you realize you've been born for it? You have to taste of those divine moments where heaven and earth powerfully collide. where we can be aware of the real and close unseen world. And discontentment is birthed in your heart. Discontentment brings us out of mediocre, remember? So celebrate the discontentment. Pastor, I'm so frustrated with the church. I want this. I want that. I'm so discontent. So I'm going to go and look for something else. No. Be, <clears throat> celebrate the discontentment and dry, let it drive you to the altar. It can drive you somewhere other place, but you're not, you'll be just as discontented because it all has to do with within you. If you handle it correctly, discontentment, it will lead us on a journey that will change everything. Most of us, when we're discontent, then we just kind of drive away, walk away, drift away. But it really needs to push us closer to God. Hannah was discontented with being the wife that had no child. She was discontented to being the one every time she went to the tabernacle was the one that was ridiculed, the one that was mocked, the one that was taunted. She was tired of it, discontented. And it didn't get to her for a while. But one day she said, I am tired. Give me at least one boy. Just one boy, and I'll give him back to you. One boy to shut that woman up. One boy that I might understand and know who you are, my womb being open. One boy. Pure discontentment beckons us into the place of prayer. The goal in prayer is to bridge two worlds. Your goal in prayer is not to just get what you want. Ask what you will, and he will give it to you. That's not prayer. That's just you want something, and you are living in a day and age where you get what you want. And if you don't get it right away, you keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. <clears throat> Somebody wanted something from me the other day, texted me. I, did, I said no, so they cursed me out and so on and so forth and said bad things. Don't want to ever talk to you again. I said, okay, thank you very much. To an hour later. Then the next day. Beep. I was like, <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> Three days running. It's not just about asking. We are not satisfied with the gulf between availability and experience. Let me get this down for a minute so I can lift up my Bible without crashing my iPad. This is availability. 
What is there? Mountains can be moved. You can walk through valleys. You can be in a fiery furnace and have a fourth man. You can be in a lion's den and no one bites you. Hallelujah. You can go forth and praise and it can confuse the enemy. You can be sick and you can be healed. You can be blind. You can see. You can be deaf. You can hear. Right? You can even be dead, which is the end of everything, and be brought back to life. Not immediately, just three days later. Four days later. Even after you stink. Availability. Availability. He will meet your every need. Demons will flee. Right? Just read the stories. You can go before kings and not be killed. You can even up, give it up your life and still rejoice and give God praise as they're stoning you. I see heaven. I see Yeshua. Most of us have been running so fast, we wouldn't have saw nothing. But Stephen knew there was a greater cause available. It's a big gulf between available and experience. What are you experiencing? What have you experienced? The only thing that we experience sometimes is the things that this world gives us. And as nice as that is sometimes, nice car, nice <clears throat> house, nice this, nice that, it's not satisfying. Seems to be, but it won't. When you stand before the Lord, He ain't going to say, what kind of car were you driving? Somebody better say amen. Thank God He's not going to ask you that. Could be depending on where you're going to be in heaven. Or we don't allow those cars to be parked up here. You have to go back that way. But my encounters with Yehoah should remind you of what is available. Your prayers express your desperate cry to experience everything that is available. Lord, if you said it, I want it. If you said it, it can be done. I want it done. If you said that people, <clears throat> I saw people delivered, that can be delivered in my life. I saw people healed, it can be healed in my life. I saw people saved, a murderer be saved. A fisherman who, who denies you become powerful. I want that. I need that. May revival stir our hearts. May revival stir our cry. May we cry out for everything that Jehovah has made available for us to experience. We're falling short. We're not gaining all of our spiritual inheritance. Desperation. Someone yell it. Are you desperate? You know what desperate is? It's an act or an attempt, tried in despair, or when everything else has failed, having little hope of success. She went to every doctor, spent all her money, no success. She slept with her husband every year, I'm sure more than a year, to no avail. Desperate situations call for desperate measures. If we've ever been desperate in a, in a desperate situation, it is now as a nation. I'm telling you, we are in desperate need. We don't need more stimulus. We don't need more laws. We don't need more policies. We don't need more this. We don't need more that. We don't need more protests. We don't need more this. We need Men, women falling on their face, crying out to God that God would heal our land. Do you understand what Chronicles says? You can't heal it. Only God can do it. Because only God can change the heart of any of us. Because our heart is wicked, deceitfully evil, unless it's touched by a man named Yeshua HaMashiach. Do you want revival? When Yehovah is sought in desperation, he responds. How desperate are you? How desperate are you? Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise. 
We're desperate for you. We're not perfect. Not sinless all the time. Not thinking straight. We got some problems. But we know that you work in spite of those problems. Because as we look at the Bible, we see that you used imperfect people to do your perfect will. We cry out to you, Lord, in desperation. Change me. Forget about my husband. Forget about my wife. Forget about my children. Forget about the church or my nation. Change me first. And when you change me, then you make me available and powerful to start changing things. I'm desperate for you. If you're desperate, just stand before the Lord, lift both your hands, and begin to speak to Him in desperation. Move on us. Change us. Help us. Pour yourself out on us. Fill us with your Spirit. Refill us with your Ruach. Let us fill your Spirit. Just lift your hands and worship with Pastor Kenny. Yielding yourself, surrendering yourself. Not denying the situation or circumstances, but refusing to continue to live in that circumstance. Because God is God and always will be God. Maybe you need to just rededicate your life. Maybe you need to come to the altar and say, Lord, here I am. <clears throat> I've compromised. I backslide. But I'm going to make a commitment this morning. Maybe you're not as desperate. You need to come to the altar and say, Lord, make me desperate. The air I breathe, you are the air I breathe, your holy presence living.
Thank you for every child that's represented underneath this prayer shawl. We thank you for their life. We thank you for the ministry that's within them, the destiny and purpose that you've called them to. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in their lives. Lord, as they continue to walk out, Father, this life of discipleship with you, we thank you and praise you, Father, as you continue to anoint them with power, grace, mercy, authority. Give them, Father, the power to overcome even in this evil day. Let them see you, feel you, know you. Fill them up with you, and we'll give you praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands to receive the priestly blessing. Yahovah, 
Yehovah, he who exists, kneel before you, presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing you order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you, will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah, here from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. In the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See you in the Oneg. If anyone